and so my name is Nishat. Um, I'm currently a senior at Brooklyn College studying computer science. Um, and before I even got into tech, I actually used to be a mob boss. That's my mugshot at age seven right there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking about how diversity, for diversity's sake, can actually be very harmful for marginalized groups within tech. And uh, this is a very sensitive topic, so um, I'll be sharing with you my own perspective. <laughs> so according to Merriam-Webster, a unicorn is a mythical being with the body of a horse and a spiral crown uh, on its forehead. And they're usually used to represent magic and purity, um, and they're considered to be rare. In tech, if you call someone or something a unicorn, you're usually commenting out on how rare they are or how uh, they've accomplished something that's seemingly impossible. So if you call someone a unicorn, it can actually be very, uh, it can be a compliment, you know, who doesn't want to be considered magical or uh, unique or beautiful. But as with a lot of other words, um, when taken out of one context and placed into another, the meaning can completely change, um, and so can its effect. So I actually uh, was not really exposed to programming or design in high school. I got into tech my sophomore year of college, and um, I really enjoyed it. I was also one of the only women in my uh, intro to C++ class. Um, and as I continued to attend events, um, apply for internships, and then eventually for full-time jobs, um, I started hearing the same phrase over and over again. And people would always comment on how uh, rare it was to see a woman of color who also wore the hijab and liked to code. And these were never said in a negative light. It was always like a positive thing where people were uh, happy that diversity was increasing, whatever that meant. Um, and so um, at first, I started to take it as a compliment because um, if you're part of a marginalized group, you know how high the odds are stacked against you. Um, it can be 10 times harder for you to achieve something what um, other people have achieved in a blink of an eye. And so it kind of felt like it was a badge of recognition of how, how many hardships I had to overcome. And when the first recruiter called me a unicorn or when they called me unique, it felt pre pretty good. It felt like I was finally um, getting somewhere. But as I continued to go on in my courses and in, my, uh, in the field, it started to feel like a ball and chain around my neck because when, um, because when you are, sorry, uh, it started to be feel like a ball and chain around my neck because uh, when you are in a room and you're the only one who looks like you or you're the only one of your gender, or your educational background or your cultural background, there's a heavy weight of isolation that comes with having to represent your entire uh, group of people or your entire gender or your entire culture. And that isolation can manifest itself and internalize in very heavily negative ways. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the term imposter syndrome. But for those of you who are not, imposter syndrome is the, um, the feeling of not, a f the feeling like a fraud or feeling like you are not doing the best that you can um, or feeling like you don't belong. And I don't think that imposter syndrome is something that is uh, unique to a certain group of people. I think that everyone at some point in their time feels like a fraud. Um, it's just a human psychological uh, feeling. But, and, and, um, and a lot of the times when you're feeling like a fraud, it's kind of instinctive to look around you and kind of find someone who is similar to you and reassure yourself that if they made it, then you can too. But if you're from a marginalized group, then you don't have that safety net. You can't look at the person next to you and compare yourself to them um, because oftentimes and not, oft more times than not, you're the only one um, from an underrepresented group in the room. So there is no safety net. 
And so this, is, this slide is kind of the thesis of my talk. Unicorns don't exist. Um, at least they haven't been scientifically proven to exist. Uh, <laughs> but you know, and even if they do, they're very rare. So if you're calling someone a unicorn, you're basically saying that they don't exist. Um, and if you keep telling someone that they're unique or that they are unheard of, it kind of just builds up to more and more imposter syndrome, more and more isolation, or more feelings of doubt. Um, and if you and as you continually, repeatedly tell someone this, I kind of question how there can be more diversity within the tech field, or how you can achieve um, any sort of inclusiveness. Uh, there are so many calls to action nowadays about increasing diversity and increasing um, like inclusivity within the field, but if you keep marking uh, the same people who are underrepresented in the, in the tech field as outliers or unique, then you can't really have a full, um, a really diverse field. It's, you're just kind of labeling them as oddities or as making them feel as though they don't belong. Um, which kind of is an oxymoron because, you know, how can you say you need more diversity, but you keep saying that the people who are underrepresented are um, the odd ones out. And the second part to that um, oxymoron is that if you're trying to get more underrepresented groups within tech to, um, to learn how to code, to learn how to design, or get into research, but you're also saying that their peers that they see within the, uh, within the field are oddities or have accomplished something impossible, it's kind of stopping them from even opening that door. It's implying that tech is a field that only a certain kind of person can get into or it's a certain kind of skill um, that you have to learn or you have to accomplish something impossible, which is definitely not the case and it should not be the case. Um, so, this is a very bold statement, um, and that's why I have the word kinda in there. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. Um, if you look around the room right now, there's a lot of diversity, there's a lot of inclusiveness, um, which is why I'm saying that the pipeline issue is, doesn't really exist anymore. I'm not saying that it's where it needs to be. It definitely is not. Uh, where it needs to be. But there are so many awesome programs and resources nowadays, everything from Girls Who Code to Code 2040 to Lesbians Who Tech, all these programs that are providing resources and nourishing um, and growing these communities that is, that's filling up the pipeline. And even if, uh, even if we were at a 50-50% uh, of diversity within the field, I don't think those programs should cease to exist because um, places like AlterConf create um, safe places where we can come together and celebrate and communicate. And even if there were more women than men in tech, I don't think, uh, I don't think conferences like uh, the Grace Hopper Celebration should cease to exist because they're kind of an acknowledgement of who we are and they're just um, more of a community, bu uh, building communities. And so, the pipeline issue is actually not the biggest contributing factor, I think, to the lack of diversity within the field. Um, as I said before, there are a lot more candidates nowadays who are um, of the diverse type uh, and who are applying and um, who are part of these communities. Um, and so, in my opinion, I think that we are just not seeing these communities reflected within um, companies or within spaces that are uh, typically not as welcoming to marginalized groups. So uh, this is just, a uh, the, this is a self-reported uh, statistic from a few major tech companies in 2015. Um, and as you can see, it's very disproportionate to uh, not only gender, but also uh, um, underrepresented people of color. And this has always been kind of confusing to me because for the past five years, um, or even more so, you keep hearing um, 
all, all these companies have their own diversity initiatives. They're throwing money at the problem. They have tailored uh, programs and fellowships and scholarships um, just for uh, people of color and for other marginalized groups. So it's definitely not for lack of trying that they um, are not seeing any results. And this is another um, set of data was taken from the uh, National Sci Science Foundation. Um, and as you can see, it's kind of an inverted bell curve. And again, this, it's from 2004 to 2014. And you can tell, again, how dismal the numbers are in terms of diversity um, and representation. But they are increasing. We're definitely not where we uh, need to be, but it is slowly increasing. And I think it's with the help of all these different initiatives and programs um, that are helping the numbers. And so I actually am the vice president of the Women in Computer Science Club at my college. And I myself have created a lot of programs and a lot of um, events that uh, place emphasis on uh, diversity. And I'm also someone who is a triple minority, I guess. Um, so I, I can tell, I can, you, and you can usually tell if you are part of a marginalized group whether or not someone's diversity initiative is on a surface level or is at its core. And this is um, another issue that I have, is that if a company's diversity, uh, okay, if a company's diversity um, initiatives are um, very shallow, then it kind of drives people of marginalized groups away because they start to feel as though they're another number with to fill some kind of quota or to add to the statistic. And it kind of makes, it undervalues their skills and their assets and it drives them away from tech altogether oftentimes as well. Um, yeah. Um, so if you, um, so if you take on the practices that a lot of the communities like um, AlterConf or um, Girls Who Code have built up, and those communities are reflected within um, companies and other uh, major organizations, then I think that there will be a better way to retain diversity instead of um, driving diversity away. And these are a few of um, the things that I've noticed that the companies that tend to retain diversity more or where their initiatives feel better as a person of color, as a woman of color, um, these are usually a few of the things that they do well, and it's um, training to overcome unconscious bias. Uh, none of these things are particularly new. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of all these points before, but diversifying from recru uh, recruiting from uh, diverse locations as well. Like a lot of companies overlook um, students from huge uh, public colleges or from community colleges, um, considering skills that are outside of the experience other than coding. Um, coding is really just problem solving. So there are a lot more experiences that can go into it. And lastly, I just wanted to end my slide presentation with all the unicorns that I've met uh, in the past two years. Right, thank you. So good morning. Good morning. Um, I, I, act, I really appreciate the presentation. I think that the arguments really hold water. There is no such thing as unicorns, basically. That's bad for all of us, I guess, in that sense. But as someone who is in tech, but in a non-technical role, mm -hmm. and so I have, um, you might have seen my tweet. Um, I do disagree with the argument that the pipeline issue does not exist. Um, because for non-technical roles, I noticed that it's still significantly less diverse than mm. people in technical positions. So, you know, I've seen, we've done a great, we've done, we've made great strides in making tech more diverse for technical roles. How would you extend that so that even non-technical roles would be more diverse, would accept more people from marginalized communities? Um, I think that question, uh, it actually goes a lot deeper. It's also about how we treat those technical roles um, socially and politically, I think. So I think people need to be a bit more educated on the emphasis of how those non-technical roles can um, play into play, play along with the technical roles as well. Um, there's definitely a certain bias that goes against non-technical roles, 
especially within the field. Um, and I have also noticed that there's, even within tech, um, in terms of gender, a lot of times women are pushed away from technical roles into non-technical roles. Um, and so th that's another layer. Um, I totally agree with you. So your point about how like no one wants to be like a quota, like a number in a quota, or like how it's uncomfortable constantly telling, told you're an outlier, I think is true, but it's interesting because like I was also like the only woman in my computer science program when I was in college. And I didn't like it if people like were like, oh, you're the only woman, that's so weird. But I also kind of liked being acknowledged. Like it, I feel like there's a give and take, right? Like if everyone ignores it, like the fact that like you're the only woman, then I don't know, then there's like it's nice for someone to say, oh, we know that you're the only woman. And that's probably really stressful for you in these ways. So I feel like I don't know if you have any advice about kind of bridging that gap of like not just ignoring it and pretending like it doesn't matter, mm -hmm. but then also not like pointing it out all the time and talking about how unique you are. Um, yeah, I also agree with you. That's kind of what I mentioned in the beginning, how it felt like an, um, an acknowledgement of how hard it is um, to be a woman in tech or to be a part of a marginalized group. Um, I really think that has to do a lot with allies um, and how they can help um, create the environment that you're in uh, a little bit better. Um, and I think that, uh, actually, I don't really have a lot of uh, advice for you. I'm sorry. But I think that um, acknowledging it is good, but like wearing it as a badge can sometimes drive away allies and it can sometimes. Um, I, I just, I don't think that that should be your identity as well. Uh, yeah, and I think we're out of time. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you.